Uh, we're going to look at the globular cluster Messier 68. So here's a picture of it. I mean, to a first approximation, when you've seen one globular cluster, you've seen them all. But actually, that turns out to be what's interesting about this cluster is that it's pretty much the same as all the other globular clusters. This is actually a Hubble Space Telescope picture of it. So it's not the whole of the cluster, but it's sort of the inner parts. So as you can see, it really is a very spherical collection of lots and lots of stars, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of stars. Let me just remind you of a little bit of the details of what you can learn by studying these things. This is a study of this cluster, Messier 68, and it's CCD photometry, so it's kind of modern imaging, although it's from a fair while ago now, from the 1990s. So the blue, the visual, which is green light, and eye, which is kind of very red light. And the classic thing that astronomers do once they've made that measurement is you make one of these things called a color magnitude diagram, where how bright the galaxy is in one magnitude is plotted on this axis here versus a color here. So it's the difference between the magnitudes in two bands. So basically bluish things are over here, reddish things are over here, faint things are at the bottom, bright things are at the top. So on this diagram, for example, the things down here are main sequence stars. Those are stars which are turning hydrogen into helium. The things up here are what are known as horizontal branch stars. They're turning helium into carbon in their guts. And actually you can learn a lot just by studying these diagrams, like how far up this sequence runs, basically tells you how old the cluster is, those kinds of things. So we can learn a lot about it. And so it turns out, again, this is a completely typical globular the cluster, the shape of those sequences on the diagram are just what we would expect. And coincidentally, this object, Messier 68, was kind of used as an exemplar to, to, to explain why this commonality between clusters was an interesting phenomenon. Way back in this paper, 1920 paper by a guy called Harlow Shapley, who was one of the founding figures of astronomy. And one of the things that he's most famous for, which is where this fits in, was really understanding the size and shape of the Milky Way and where we were within it. He actually picked this globular cluster, Messier 68, as kind of his poster child to illustrate the techniques he was using. And the main thing that Shapley was doing was trying to figure out the distances to globular clusters as a way of kind of mapping out the structure of our galaxy. And actually he used three different methods on these globular clusters to figure out what their distances were. So the first one, which was kind of the technique that had been around the longest, was just to look at how big they appeared to be. And if you assume that they're actually all intrinsically the same size, then if you see a big globular cluster, it's got to be close to you. And if you see a very small one, it's got to be a long way away. The second thing he did was to start looking at the properties of the individual stars. Now, he wasn't producing these color magnitude diagrams. He was just looking at magnitude. So he was only had photographs essentially in one color. So he was just seeing how bright the stars were. And he did two things with those brightnesses. Firstly, he just looked at the brightest stars. And again, by picking out how bright they appear to be, if they're all intrinsically the same actual brightness, you can figure out how far away the cluster is, because if those brightest stars appear very faint, that tells you it's a long way away. If those brightest stars appear relatively bright, that means it's relatively close. The final technique was actually, if we go back to our sort of better quality modern diagram, and actually I want to just zoom in on this region. Right? And so conveniently there is a zoomed in version. There we go. And it turns out, if we look at this one at the top here, most stars just shine with the same brightness the whole time, but there are some stars which, whose brightness varies with time. And usually in a fairly characteristic way, they tend to oscillate in brightness. And it turns out those stars all live in this region of the diagram. It's the part of the diagram where stars are burning helium into carbon, this thing called the horizontal branch. And the nice thing about it is it's horizontal, which if you look at this diagram again, if things are horizontal, that means they all have more or less the same value of brightness. So all these variable stars are intrinsically the same brightness. And again, by picking out those variable stars, you can play the same game of seeing how bright they actually appear to be. You know what their intrinsic brightness is. That tells you how far away the cluster has to be. So we had these three different methods all of which were essentially measuring the same thing. And actually for this particular case, which is, could well be why he picked it as his typical example, they all gave more or less the same answer. And in fact, the answer he ended up with was about 50,000 light years away. A modern analysis of the same thing puts the cluster at about 34, 35,000 light years away. So, you know, he was in the right ballpark. Now, the reason why this was kind of a, a, an important measurement, this one on its own, you know, getting the distance to one globular cluster is vaguely interesting, but doesn't tell you a huge amount. But he did dozens and dozens of globular clusters. And what he found is that they distributed all around the sky in a roughly sort of spherical halo. And the center of that halo of globular clusters is nowhere near where the sun is. So the sun's kind of offset from the center of this distribution, which was sort of not what was expected because when people had measured sort of the structure of the Milky Way the other way, which was just basically to count stars in different directions, you came up with an answer which says that the Sun is remarkably, almost implausibly close to the middle of the galaxy. And we now know why that is. That's because there is all this obscuration out there, this murk out there, 
which means that actually if you count stars, you can only see them to a certain distance away before they kind of, kind of vanish into this, uh, the, the obscuration into the murk. The two things that Shapley was able to show by doing this thing with the globular clusters was to show, firstly, we're nowhere near the middle of the galaxy, we're out in one of the boring suburbs, but actually, secondly, that the Milky Way was way bigger than had been thought to be in the past. So he kind of revolutionised our view of our galaxy just by playing these games, looking at the globular clusters around it, of which Messier 68 is kind of the classic example. Around, and it's quite an unsteady, and you've got your cup of coffee sitting in front of you, and you look down, what you'll see are these concentric rings. You'll see this pattern. And what that is, is a manifestation of something called a Bessel function.